In episode six, Corey, along with UBA's fixer, goes back to that publication and says, hey, we have a juicier story. We've got two female anchors in a gay relationship. At first, the publication's like, ah, it's not that juicy, kind of old hat, this isn't 1999 anymore. But in order to kill the Hannah story, Corey goes so far as to tell the publication where they're going to be so that they can snap photos and get, quote, proof of it. Bradley, however, is still in Las Vegas reporting on the DNC. She's doing a great job, by the way, but back at UBA, Daniel continues to make some waves. He does an interview with a guy named Peter Bullard, who's doing a new show for UBA+. Plus. It's going to be an interview show. But instead of interviewing him, Daniel turns the interview awkward and combative because I guess this Peter Bullard guy had said some not nice things about Daniel before. Daniel decided to stick up for himself. It's completely off script, though. And it's one that Bullard ends up taking exception to, calling not only Stella, but Corey to complain about it. The next day, everybody from Vegas returns. Mia gives Bradley a nice ovation and lets her know that she's going to be heading to Phoenix and doing her own debate. Not filling in this time, but actually doing her own debate since she killed it out there. The one issue they have is nobody has an update on where exactly Alex is. And that includes Chip, who's supposed to be her producer. Chip is making excuse after excuse, really hiding behind the fact that her back was acting up. In reality, he doesn't have any idea where she is. And the network is getting antsy. They paid for her to come back, and she was back for all of, I don't know, seven days? And now she's disappeared once again. So Stella and Mia have to meet with Chip to try to get an answer on when he thinks she might be back. But Chip's timetable is pretty vague. Corey then walks into the meeting to talk about the whole Peter Bullard situation because Bullard is really mad. And Mia takes Daniel's side of things, saying he thought he was sparring. But that's not the way Peter Bullard saw it, which means it's not the way Corey sees it. Corey then tries to get an update on what's going on with Alex, but Chip tells him the same thing he told both me and Stella. Really isn't one. They're just kind of in wait-and-see mode. And that means they need to find a replacement for Alex in the meantime. They start throwing out some ideas, and that's when Chip throws out, well, what about Laura Peterson? And Corey loves the idea. Not only is she a big name, but she's going to drive Alex nuts. It might actually drive Alex so nuts that she returns. Corey then calls Laura Peterson, and he's unaware that Bradley's over at her house, And Corey throws the idea out there, and Bradley begs her to take it, which she ultimately does. After Laura gets off the phone, Bradley suggests that maybe she just stay there. I mean, they have to head to the same place anyway, and they have to get up really early. And Laura takes it one step further by saying, you know, you can bring some stuff over. It's fine. So Bradley heads back to her hotel room to grab some things, but she has an unwelcome visitor. It's her brother, who showed up out of the blue. Puts a whole wrench in her quasi-moving into Laura's place. Bradley has to text Laura back saying, I'm not going to be able to make it. My brother showed up. She's also pretty suspicious. Her brother's had substance abuse issues in the past, and he just shows up out of the blue. It begs the question, why is he there? But his answer is he misses Bradley, and Bradley isn't their mother. So Bradley has to scrap the plans that she had and entertain her bro. The next day, Bradley and Laura head into TMS separately. And as Laura is walking in, she notices Chip in his office sitting there in the dark. She walks in and starts kind of poking fun at him, but starts asking about how Alex is doing. Chip gives her the spiel that she's fine, her back is acting up, she should be okay, should be back soon. And Laura tells him, I just wanted to make sure she was okay. I mean, Maggie was concerned. She said Alex was in quite a state when she came to her hotel room. And this is the first that Chip is hearing about any of this. He plays it off like he was aware, but he definitely wasn't. And he chalks it up to her being, quote, not her best that night, saying that she had mixed prescription pills and she was feeling funny. He tries to find out from Laura exactly what Alex might have said, but Laura says, Maggie didn't tell me what she said, she just was concerned. Once Laura leaves, Chip ends up calling Alex's place and asks her just to pick up the phone, but she doesn't because she's not in her place. Once Laura left Corey's office, though, she doesn't feel all that comfortable returning to morning television. She's a pro, though. She gets ready to go on television. Stella and Corey come down to see how everything goes. And while Bradley and Laura are playful, they don't give off any vibes that they're actually together. Shortly after the broadcast starts, though, Stella ends up leaving the control room because she has to meet with Yanko over the fight. She saw the video. She knows that Yanko stuck up for her, but she still has to address the situation. As she heads to her office, she gets stopped by Sybil. And Sybil wants to make sure that because of the fact that Yanko was sticking up for her, her judgment won't be clouded on the situation. Stella says, with all due respect, Sybil, decisions can be made without you standing behind me. And Sybil says, well, with all due respect, I'm giving you all the respect you deserve. You and Corey were brought here to clean things up, and it seems like you've done the exact opposite. The talent is running roughshod all over you guys. These are people. You can control them. And if you can't, you find people that you can. 
I made it clear to Corey that it was the board's decision to fire Bradley Jackson for her, quote, mystery illness. But you two decided to put her on air the next morning. And Stella lets her know that is complete news to me. Sybil, though, doesn't believe that at all. She reminds Stella that Corey is going to bat for her a lot. So, quote, don't act like you two aren't two peas in a pod. Stella then goes in her office and waits for Yanko to show up. And when he does, he's got a little bit of a black eye. Right off the bat, she thanks him for sticking up for her. The two seem to bond over the fact that she was the weird Korean kid and he was the weird Cuban kid. Yanko thinks, though, that that's it. That's the whole meeting, her thanking him. He gets up to leave and Stella says, wait, where are you going? I still have to suspend you. And Yanko can't believe that she's about to suspend him for sticking up for her. He tells Stella, I'm a racist when I say spirit animal, but then I beat up a racist and I get suspended? I mean, what am I supposed to do? And Stella says, you're supposed to do the weather. And Yanko just walks out. And ironically, he walks out as they're doing the weather on the morning show. And his villain is terrible. It gives Bradley and Laura a little bit of a break. Bradley takes the opportunity to check in on her brother. She had a little bit of an awkward morning running into him. She was checking him for drugs and he woke up. She notices that he's called a few times, so she reminds him, I can't answer, I'm on TV. And that's when he sends her an article saying that Bradley and Laura are in a relationship. Bradley gets extremely uncomfortable with this. And Laura tries to calm her down by saying, it's going to be okay. She also has to pull herself together because she goes back on the air in 10 seconds. And as she's sitting there talking about Groucho Marx on the air, the control room is seeing exactly what has her so frazzled. Most of the talent actually starts talking about whether they believe it's true or not. Daniel says aloud that he hopes the story isn't true, and Yanko's replacement says why, because being gay is your thing? And Daniel says no, because I think it's horrible and painful to be publicly outed. It's nobody's business. This causes the weatherman to apologize and just walk away. As soon as the segment is over, Bradley runs to her dressing room to just try and get her thoughts together, and that's when Laura walks in. At first, Bradley says, you shouldn't be here. I mean, what happens if people see us both leaving this room? And Laura says, well, if it were true, we'd have to make sure that we weren't seen together. But this was just bullshit gossip, so we're in here discussing how we're going to handle it. Bradley, though, isn't quite catching up on the fact that Laura is insinuating it didn't happen, it's all lies. She's still extremely uncomfortable, and Laura says, why are you so upset? And Bradley says, it's because I don't want my private life public. Laura asks, well, can you talk to your brother about the situation? But Bradley says, no, I don't want anybody knowing my business, especially my family. Laura eventually convinces Bradley that this will all be okay, even though it's completely messed up, and Bradley comes back and closes out the show. As Mia is leaving the control room after the show, she overhears Chip talking to Raina about the fact that he doesn't know exactly where Alex is. He hasn't even talked to her. If it wasn't for the fact that Alex was talking to a production assistant named Isabella, he'd be legitimately concerned. And when Mia overhears this, she flips out. Unbeknownst to both Chip and Raina, Mia is on edge because of the fact that Vanity Fair is posting an excerpt from Maggie Brenner's book. And the headline says that Mitch Kessler targeted black women. And it makes Mia completely uncomfortable. She has a little bit of PTSD. So when she catches Chip and Raina talking, it sets her off. Chip apologizes to Mia because he can see that something's going on with her and tells her, I just want to help. And Mia says, well, if you want to help, then get my lead anchor back. And that forces Chip over to Alex's apartment. He enters very tentatively saying, hey, Alex, I'm here. Don't be scared. But he doesn't find Alex. That's when Chip discovers that Alex isn't there at all. There is someone there, however. It's Isabella. And they both are pretty surprised to see each other. And that's when Chip starts putting two and two together, that Isabella is basically house-sitting for Alex, which means that Isabella probably knows where Alex is. Chip says, I need you to tell me where she is, but Isabella says, I can't. She told me not to tell anybody. And when Chip says, well, I'm not anybody, Isabella lets him know that Alex made it specifically known she was not to tell Chip where Alex was. The conversation, though, turns pretty hostile. Isabella finds some cause to get mad at Chip. I think she picked sexism, but it might have went white knight. I don't know. It was weird. It culminates in Isabella just screaming at Chip, and Chip just kind of throwing his hands up in the air and saying, "Uh, okay, and leaving, knowing that he's not getting any answers from Isabella at all. That same night, Bradley has yet to go home. She's hiding in her dressing room, and Laura calls her to see how her conversation with her brother went, only to find out that She's scared to actually confront him. After a little bit of back and forth, Laura convinces Bradley that she needs to go home. She needs to actually see her brother and talk to him about the situation. So Bradley reluctantly does. 
And as soon as Bradley enters the room, it's obvious on why she wanted to avoid her brother because the fighting starts right away. Her brother lets her know that their mother is completely embarrassed by this. They come from a very small town. Everybody's talking about it. And the two end up getting in a fight about why Bradley hasn't revealed this information before. They start fighting about their mother. And Bradley yells at him, I thought you came here to get away from her. And Hal says, no, I came here because I'm on drugs. I'm using. Hal goes on to tell Bradley that their mother has gotten insufferable. Even with Bradley's help, she's actually gotten worse. He knows that if he's around Bradley, he won't use. But his mom kind of drives him to use. The fighting, however, gets interrupted when Corey knocks on the door. And Corey can hear the fighting inside. Bradley is trying to get her brother to calm down. She ends up leaving Hal behind to go talk to Corey. And he's shown up there to tell her that as far as the network is concerned, she doesn't have to address the situation at all. He also lets her know that if she wants to sue, the network will back her. But Bradley doesn't know if she wants to sue. She's just kind of confused and taking the whole situation in. She asks, Corey, why was today so hard? I mean, why do I care what those horrible people think of me? And Corey asks, you mean the public? And Bradley says, no, I mean my family. I mean, when I'm with Laura, I see who I aspire to be. And then when I'm with my brother, I see what I really am. Corey tries to make her feel better by telling her, hey, you're your own thing and it's working out pretty great for you. Bradley then starts to say, maybe this is a good thing. Maybe this will force me to say that I actually care about somebody. And I've never really done that before, but I realize I I do want Laura. She then thanks Corey for the mini therapy session and walks back in the room and tells Hal, you gotta go. Thank you so much for checking out this recap. Please consider subscribing to the channel. Hit thumbs up if you liked it. Smash that thumbs down button if you thought this sucked. Make sure to be nice in the comment section. If you don't see the next video up in the end screen there, I'll get it up in a few days not to worry. And I have merchandise, you know? So go buy a mug or something. It's never too early to think about Christmas gifts, folks. Once again, thank you for checking out this recap.